So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about chapter 5. It's a one out of a two-part lecture I'm going to be giving on this topic. And what we're going to be dealing with is an energy analysis of closed systems, which we've really been doing already. But I would like to talk about some of the more finer details of when we do a closed system analysis. What are the things we've been looking for? Maybe uh, some of the previous examples you have some questions hopefully this clarifies some of those questions one of the key things uh, when we talk about a closed system and we've done some examples on this is we talk about boundary work and by boundary work you may hear people also call it as PDV work or where does PDV come from well we know that work and remember work here is a path function so that's why it has this little delta instead of a D the work that's done depends on the path that this takes and we'll talk about that more here in this lecture too but work is defined as the force times distance well if we break force down into a pressure times an area we recognize that area times this height ds is also the volume we can say this is the work done the by this piston to or by this piston is equivalent to PDV. So our boundary work, if we integrate all of the uh, locations from point one to point two, we would have obtain our boundary work. We're also going to be assuming that all of these things are in quasi-equilibrium. So our system is in near equilibrium because remember in thermodynamics we are studying it from state to state. So we're looking at something that is um, assumed in equilibrium at each point as we go along here in our analysis. In actuality, so in a car engine, we may be able to make this assumption, but it may not be as accurate as if we took an actual measurement. But we can get an idea using the thermodynamic relationships, what is the maybe the maximum amount of work that we can achieve out of this system using some of these analyses. So here you see a piston, and all of these boundary works, what we're going to be dealing with is a piston cylinder device here. So this would represent a diesel or a gasoline type engine, where we have pressure increase and pushes the cylinder up. So we're able to get usable work out of this system. So we would consider that as a positive if it's expanding. Now as the cylinder comes back down and compresses this gas, we're adding work to the system, doing work on the system, okay? And that would be a um, negative value when we consider in our thermodynamic analysis. Now if we integrate, so here's a graph, of PV graph here, pressure and volume. So remember in the first slide I talked about this, here's this term, this delta term, it depends on the path. So the bigger the path, or the bigger the area underneath this curve, because remember we're integrating PDV. So we're integrating this area underneath the curve. So this, the bigger the area underneath the curve, the more work that we have done uh, by our system. So you can see here, as the area underneath this curve shrinks, so does the amount of work that we're able to get out of this system or the amount of work that comes out of the system is. In a cycle, the amount of work that's done in our cycle, so if we go from one to two, so here from one to two we're compressing our piston cylinder or gas or whatever it is in our cylinder and then it expands. So in this case our amount of work that we're getting out is larger so if we integrate everything under A and subtract it from everything that we put in all that work under B this is how much work we're actually getting out of our system it's represented here by this work net so um, what we assume when we integrate this is we can assume several things we can assume that pressure is constant for the process which sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And if we assume that it is constant, we can easily integrate this. And this would be the pressure times the change in volume in our system. 
Well, sometimes we may assume that this <coughs> pressure follows what's a polytropic process. And uh, this polytropic process looks like this. We make the assumption that the pressure is equal to some constant times volume to the uh, minus n power. And this exponent we can assign some value to depending on what type of process it is. So if we substitute this P is equal to CV in our definition of work, our PDV equation, we would obtain, and you can go through the integration here, so you know we integrate C times V to the minus N, here's the standard um, um, integration, you can get this from your integration tables, and plugging in C uh, times V to the minus N times V2, we could recognize that C to the V2 to the minus N is just equal to P2. So we could get our uh, value for a polytropic process here. And uh, if we substitute in, if we know it's an ideal gas, we can put in uh, P is equal to, uh, or PV is equal to MRT, and we could obtain a, a relationship for that. If we have an isothermal process, that means that temperature is the same uh, for both cases. I mean, for both uh, states, between 1 and 2, we would obtain this relationship here. If we have a constant pressure process, it becomes much easier. We could just take out the pressure and integrate this volume. The question is here stated, what is the boundary work for a constant volume process? So what is the boundary work for a constant? How much work are we getting if the volume does not change? How much work are we getting out of this system? Or how much boundary work, I should say, are we getting out of this system? Well, the volume doesn't change. Here, if V2 is equal to V1, <coughs> we can assume that this would go to 0. How about if V2 is equal to V1 here? LN of 1 is 0. How about V2 minus V1? This would be 0. So we could say that the boundary work for a constant volume process is zero. So let's go back and look at the energy balance. Now we've already talked about this, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But if we're looking at a closed system, and specifically some type of process or some type of cycle, we can analyze how much work and how much um, heat how much change in energy there is within our system. So here you see the general first law of thermodynamics. So this is applicable for any system undergoing any process. And here's the same equation just written per unit time. So units of these are watts, these are in joules. These are written per unit mass. Now if we have a cycle let me go to the next slide here. If we have a cycle, and this is our point one, we go through our cycle here, and our, we end up back to where we started at our point two, we can assume that the difference in our energy in our system, so the change in internal kinetic and potential energies, is zero. Then we would know that the heat that's transferred to the system is equivalent to the amount of work that's done on or to the system. So it's just simplifying the first law of thermodynamics for this cycle. Another important note here is that, and it's interesting to note, that the first law cannot be proven mathematically. Now we know that nothing has violated the first law, and it's difficult to prove it mathematically because it's its own conservation law. So if it depended, if we could derive the conservation of energy based on the conservation of mass or based on the conservation of momentum, it would depend on those. It would not be its own conservation law. So that's one um, consideration we make when we're looking at the first law of thermodynamics is that it's its own law. And it, you guys should, all, should know that it hasn't been proven mathematically, but nothing has been known to violate it. 
Now this is a an application, another application of using the energy balance, and this is specifically for a constant pressure expansion. So let me highlight this here. So this is for constant pressure expansion. Let me put this in yellow letters or something. Constant pressure. Okay, so this is only applicable for constant pressure. If we look at this system, and let's say that as this heats up, this piston moves up or moves so that the pressure is constant in this system, and we do our energy balance where our our first law of thermodynamics is written as Q minus W equals the change in energy in our system. And we say that the heat transfer, and we break up the work term into boundary work and also other work, which would be this voltage and current coming into the system. We write our boundary work as PDV, but since our pressure is constant, we can take it out of the integral, And we can rewrite this as U2 plus P2V2 minus U1 plus P1V1, knowing that U plus PV is equal to H, we can rewrite this as Q minus this work that's done here is equal to H2 minus H1, or the change in enthalpy. And please note, this is only applicable for a constant pressure system. Okay, so here's we know that the change in internal energy plus the boundary work is equal to the change in enthalpy. And remember, constant pressure is the only time where this is applicable. So let's talk a little bit about specific heats, and then I will continue on in the next lecture. So specific heat is something we have not talked about. Now specific heat, the values are, or the uh, definitions are here. But here's some applications of it. If you were to heat up or supply energy or heat to this system, which in this case, this is just a chunk of iron, and you observe that if you applied a certain amount of energy, the temperature increased. Well, this is what this value lets us determine. So basically, it's a measure, or it helps us to know how much energy that a substance can store. Water being a substance that can store a lot of energy before it increases in temperature. Okay, so if you if something has a specific heat of five kilojoules, that means that it has increased after supplying five kilojoules of energy, it's increased one degree Celsius, and this substance is mass is one kilogram. So if you have this one one kilogram of this mass only increase one degree Celsius for an input of five kilojoules. Now, although these are called specific heats, it really doesn't distinguish between what type of energy is causing the temperature rise. So it doesn't have to be heat, okay? It doesn't have to be heat energy to cause the temperature increase. Okay, we may have work. We may have some type of other type of energy that's going into the system that's causing this temperature increase. So keep that in mind. The CV and CP subscripts here denote constant volume and constant pressure. So constant volume meaning if we have something that doesn't increase in volume. Constant pressure meaning something that doesn't increase <coughs> or that keeps the pressure constant. Volume can change in this case. So for example, if we had a tank of water and we heated it up somehow, we applied some type of energy to it to heat the temperature, and the volume did not change in that system, we would be able to measure the specific heat at constant volume. If we had, let's say, a gas in a tank or in some type of system that was open, and we heated this um, substance up, and it was allowed to expand as it heated, we would be able to measure the specific heat at constant pressure. Now you can imagine that the specific heat at constant pressure 
is going to be higher than the specific heated constant volume because we have to supply the energy needed to heat this gas as it also expands and there's energy associated with that also so CP will always be higher than CV so um, you know these are just properties and the way that it's defined here is that uh, we have CV is equal to the change in internal energy over the change in temperature with specific uh, with con at constant volume now these terms are written with partial derivatives because we're assuming that this value internal energy is a function of more than just temperature T it may be a function of some other variables also so we have to write it in terms of a partial derivative later on we may be able to simplify this later now the units of this are kilojoules per kilogram or you may also see it written kilojoules per kilogram degrees Kelvin okay now are these units identical here's another question that we have asked of us are they identical the answer is yes and why is that because when we calculate our CP and CV values or when we're calculating our energy inputs into our system we're going to be talking about temperature differences okay and if we multiply this by a temperature difference the difference in temperatures between degree C and degree K are equivalent okay so in other words if our uh, room temperature is 27 uh, degrees Celsius and we increase it to 37 degrees Celsius the change between those two is 10 degrees now if we have that same temperature so 27 degrees Celsius is 300 Kelvin and we heat it up to by 10 a unit of 10 Kelvin so 310 Kelvin the chain the difference between those two is also 10 so when we're talking about temperature differences it doesn't really matter the units that we're dealing with so let me go ahead and just continue this lecture on the next presentation uh, and we'll con just keep talking about uh, some other uh, subtleties of our uh, Chapter 5 of Closed Systems.